Crossroads of Life or Death is produced with passion and purpose by the Jackson Foundation. With support from Freed Hardeman University, empowering students with a higher education that integrates Christian faith, scholarship, and service in Henderson, Memphis, Dixon, and online. And from Surgical Development Partners, partnering with physicians to build a stronger foundation for quality health care. The winds accelerated today, northwesterly gusting into the 30s at times. There is a wind chill advisory till 9 a.m. for wind chills at 5 to 10 degrees below zero. Winter weather warnings encourage people to stay home as uncertainty and fear challenge the hope of a teenager without a home. My brain is everywhere. It's thinking about a new place to stay, where we're going to move, thinking about where we're going each night. At one point, I, I gave up on God. I laid in bed praying and I asked myself, why do I keep praying if he doesn't listen? Because I felt at that point he wasn't listening to me. But some people who believe God wants them to listen on his behalf are on emergency alert, not just for one teenager and his family, but also for the thousands of other homeless people in Metro Nashville, including the down and out. You're gonna freeze to death out here. If you did that, I, I'll, it'll haunt me for the rest of my life. Those who are drunk or addicted. Coke, then crack, then crack and wine, and wine and crack, and that's when it hit rock bottom those with physical and psychological challenges. It, I think it can happen to anyone that falls upon health hardships. You know, it's very scary, very frightening. People who face one failure after another. And I had a job and I lost my job and I wound up on the streets of Nashville again for probably about the 50th million time. Military veterans and even relatives of famous people. And my family pretty much uh, got to where they couldn't do much for me other than try to keep me alive. What happens when people become homeless is they become second class people or citizens. They're not seen as having the same rights we would have as citizens. Sometimes it's so easy to just want to hang your head and cry and give up, throw your hands up and just scream. It has to be shameful to think that we have to have people live like animals. The crisis of homelessness is the crisis of death. They live less than we do. Cold weather we've been warning you about all week is here. On the coldest of nights, people are lining up at Room in the Inn. Worried that someone might be overlooked, Charlie Strobel trudges through snow to the other side of the tracks a few miles away. For more than 30 years, he has tried to stand in the gap between homelessness and death. Whoa. Tonight, the well-known founder of Room in the Inn is like a shepherd out looking for lost sheep. Hello. So far, there's no one here and I'm really glad. He is soon joined in the search by someone who shares his concern. It's gonna be very cold, get down to zero. I want to make sure that these people have an opportunity to be taken care of and go to a safe location where there's heat and food and warmth and where they don't get caught out in a situation where they have no help. Well, uh, the good news is they're out of here. There's nobody here. But I'm sure they'll be back. A lingering worry compels the priest to keep looking, so he moves on, checking under bridges, in alleys, behind buildings. Let me help you get up. Come on. Don't make me have to worry all night about you. He finds the man he's been looking for, passed out on the back porch of a church property. Gary Hodge is an old friend who's been in the neighborhood for, in my neighborhood, for years. The wooden trim on the church is a display of Gary's painting skills. Partly because of a disability, he now chooses a bottle over a brush. I know I'm trying to get you to the room in the inn. Let's go. He's had housing, and then he loses his housing because of his addiction issue. And um, he owns that. He knows that's a problem, but uh, he tries to survive the best way he can. 
Hundreds of other street people have already arrived to board buses and vans, taking them to churches and synagogues throughout the city for a warm place to sleep. This has been the core of the program for over 30 years. I think it gives us our heart and our soul. Long before there was a brand new building offering other services, Charlie Strobel recognized an immediate need to help people living on the street. It became more evident to me that something needed to be done when I was sent to Holy Name in 1977, and there were poor people everywhere. On the riverbanks were all lots of shanties and huts and tar paper shacks that people who were homeless, well, we didn't call them homeless at the time, but they were living down there. And the Corps of Engineers fenced up all that property and tore down those dwellings. And so those folks went to the place of least resistance, which was the church parking lot. If they had been down the street, they would have been somebody else's problem, but that night they were my problem. And so I went out and I thought for a moment, if I do this, I may end up doing this for the rest of my life. If I let them in tonight, because what will happen tomorrow night? They'll come back. Along with bringing his guests inside, the young priest handed out peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. That's just the best I could do. And the most inspirational person in Strobel's life, his mother, was there to help him. Mary Catherine Strobel made history as the first woman to ever work for the Nashville Fire Department. But she had been a familiar face to the unfortunate for most of her life. She was known to be someone deeply committed to helping people in need, especially the poor, and was in her older years when we were starting. Um, she helped out all the time at the soup kitchen. Even with his mother's help, Father Strobel and his church were limited in what they could do. And with the winter of 1986 approaching, he challenged communities of faith to practice the love they preach. Church is like a billboard. and. Uh, it's uh, advertising, uh, openness, love. If uh, we can't provide uh, any, any of the things that we're advertising, uh, maybe we ought to shut them down. And so I sent a letter to the Tennessean inviting congregations to come and organize into a, a joint congregational effort. And four started. That winter of 86, and by the end of that winter, we had 31 congregations involved. But as Room in the Inn was getting started, something very unexpected and tragic happened. No one ever thought that someone like Mary Catherine Strobel, who had done so much for so many, would ever be treated so badly. Her body was found in the trunk of her own car, a short distance from the Nashville Rescue Mission. The killer was an escapee from a prison psychiatric ward in Michigan, and she was the first of six victims before his arrest several weeks later in Texas. I think when she died, it put everything in perspective as far as what I needed to do with my life. And I had been a pastor for almost 15 years and a priest for about 18 years. And I needed to respond to needs that were outside the particular focus of the church at that time. And so we worked it out where I would just take an inactive role and in the church and do this as a special ministry. Since Strobel made that decision, the emergency shelter program has grown from those first four congregations back in 1986 to more than 200 providing winter refuge for the homeless. When I started, they would open the door and they would come in and I would think, Gee, they are scary looking. <laughs> Some of them are big and hairy and dirty and scary. And, and God would whisper in my ear, yeah, and welcome them in. You know, of course I want outcomes. I want, pe I want to measure those in data, but it's not about data. <laughs> it's first about the relationship. And that begins with those congregations night after night after night, offering that same hospitality and telling people you can do it. We get to go out to the church and then we do get to catch a breath because we've got people willing to listen to what we're going through and the churches we've been to have been so welcoming, so warming, so comforting that when you wake up you almost feel like you're at home sleeping. When somebody can get a good night's sleep and something good to eat, they can actually the next morning kind of take the next step. The congregation concept is being increasingly copied in cities and even small communities around the country and Canada. 
not only because it has been so successful, but utilizes existing resources to provide community-wide emergency assistance without depending on government. There's just no end to it. It's like the, a ripple effect that other churches and other states could see how successful it is here. And look what we could do for homeless and lost people. Room in the Inn's congregation program offers temporary relief from the 1st of November to the end of March, but it is not a year-round solution. This is my home, and you can see we have all the amenities. <laughs> I participate in Room in the Inn, and when that program is over with, I stay in a tent. And because it is a business and on private property, uh, we have to be up early in the morning before uh, they get there and we can't get back into the camp until after they close. Kateri Pomeroy set up her tent behind a business just a few blocks from the city skyline. Her campsite is just one of many homeless communities, including this one, on a wooded hillside behind historic Fort Negley. And there are now estimated over 200 camps around the county. We have a housing crisis, not just that we don't have enough affordable housing units that can be permanent housing, we don't even have enough shelter bed spaces. You're so vulnerable when you're out in the open. You don't have doors, you don't have locks, you don't have windows you can close. So you're accessible to whoever wants to prey on you. But Kateri still goes nearly every day to Room in the Inn, where success of the congregation's program led to expansion and additional services. Construction in 2010 of a $13 million, 45,000 square foot complex provides a place where Kateri and others find a desert oasis, as Charlie Strobel calls it. And what he's done over here, man, I, I call him the, the best panhandler in Nashville. Because <laughs> he raised all the money and, and got this place built. And it's just incredible to me. I mean, at least people can see where the money's going, you know, and, it, and it's a good thing. Here the homeless can get a hot meal served by volunteers with counseling, educational programs, and opportunities for creative expression. This is the best part of my life, my art. You have to fill those holes that uh, homelessness makes, and I fill it with my art. Honestly, this sounds kind of bad, but I didn't expect as much talent as there is. It's extremely rewarding. I mean, it, this is the best job I've ever had, hands down, because it's never boring, and, uh, and you, your heart just feels full when you leave. I came here because I, uh, I actually fell off a cliff in 2000, 2001, and uh, yeah, it really got messed up. I was drinking really bad. Sean Pruitt got the medical assistance and respite care he needed. Years later, he's head cook in the kitchen. I mean, they just provided me with the opportunity to get myself sober and just concentrated on, on the sobriety because they give me a place to stay, they give me a place, they fed me all the time, you know, they, they give me my, my, my self-esteem back. Pruitt played professional baseball in the minor leagues before his slide into alcoholism. That gave him a quick connection with Charlie Strobel, a baseball lover who suited up for a recreational team well into his 60s. He lets people come in and play because he wants to help them so bad. They'd be, they'd be I mean, they're cussing at him and doing all kinds of stuff. And they never swing at him because, old Charlie, you know, there's too many people around here that love him. But they will cuss him out and, and spit or do something. And he'd just say, all right, you done? Come on. Come on over here. He just has so much compassion. Melvin Skates came to Room in the Inn for many years as a homeless drunk and drug addict who carried a knife and called himself King of the Tramps. When he finally sobered up, Melvin was given a job here as community caregiver. He's now a homeowner and deacon in his church. When somebody come through that door, I don't look at them as being an alcoholic or homeless. I look at them as me. That's me right there coming through that door. It keeps me strong. I'm not, as, I'm not, I'm not ashamed because I got purpose now. God allowed me to see. The facility offers a guest house where police can bring a publicly intoxicated person to spend the night instead of taking them to jail. Transitional housing is available for those who need help with addiction or job skills. And I'm gonna give you a couple of my cards so when oh. you go to the places and then you have a reference. 
Thank you. After dealing with the initial crisis, the ultimate goal of Room in the Inn is to help people find a permanent home. 255. Mm -hmm. Three, four. Kateri Pomeroy is getting some one-on-one -on -one help to try and find an apartment. Um, yeah, I'm looking for a one-bedroom. Uh, do you have anything available? In the, you know? Finding affordable housing for the homeless can be complicated. Uh, it's been very difficult for me because this isn't exactly how I pictured my retirement years. So I'm trying to work through that. Thank you. Oh, wow. How'd they go? Um, I'm not really feeling good about this one. It's so difficult to just go out and fill out an application. You know, when you're homeless, you don't know how to get there. You don't know, you know, what to expect. You So w with me, per on a personal basis, you know, it's just important for, that we follow her through that journey. I have arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis throughout my body, but it's affected my knees. She's hoping the small amount of income she receives for her disability will help her qualify for subsidized housing. Taking the uh, public transportation to get to public housing. <laughs> it's like falling in a deep well, that's how I look at it. You fall in a deep well and there's no way to get out because you don't have a rope, you don't have climbing gear, You're, you know, there's, and the process takes a while. You know, housing is, uh, affordable housing is very, very in short supply out on the street in search of housing, a job, or a handout, no matter the motive. The homeless are invited to room in the inn without question and given relief from the street. You know, Jesus washed feet, you know? The importance of Foot Clinic is it's their number one mode of transportation. It's we wash their feet, scrub their feet, clip their toenails, as well as work on any calluses, give them a good massage, and send them away with two clean pair of socks. You know, sometimes when you ain't been out many years on the street, this is a Something like Santa Claus coming to give you a treat. <laughs> it helps me to help them. Despite all the special services offered, all the compassion, and all the faith of caregivers, there doesn't seem to be a quick cure for homelessness. You know, I come in and I have a dream for someone, and I think they ought to be able to just do what I want them to do, and things will be better for them. And. That's not the way that, that things generally work. Um, people don't always make the same choices that I would make for them, and, and that can be difficult and frustrating. You know, everything's not beautiful here. I mean, we don't walk away and think, oh, thanks be to God, it was so great. Because sometimes it's a job and we're tired. There are people who I will look at and think, you know, I wish they had a little bit more respect for themselves. I wish that they took care of themselves more. but. You know, I could also look at myself and say those same things about myself if I took an honest look at who I am. So it's in that shared struggle in realizing that we all uh, face those things where I think you can find hope and, and start to make some of those changes. Because there are some people who I had said that about um, a long time ago, and it took years and years uh, for them to finally find something within themselves that was, was worth making some changes for. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. Me and Jesus got it all worked out. Mark Cash is on record as one of the temporary residents at Room in the Inn. He's the nephew of a late country music superstar. But this morning he's at a crossroads, Clancy's Crossroads, a coffee house for the homeless. I came uh, here completely homeless. Um, with no hope, no uh, thoughts of tomorrow. I was living in, in just minute to minute uh, due to my addiction of alcoholism. And I stumbled upon this place and they said, come on in, we're going to stop the world a minute and let you get off. How in the world did I let things get so out of hand? Drink enough whiskey, they say, should kill any man. I've been to hell's doors and I ain't going back. After I'd been sober a couple of months, a few months, they asked me to sing. And it's been such an inspiration to me. It's given me my, my life back, my, my talent back. Uh, I'm, I'm finding out who Mark is again. Not everybody gets their life back. 
48 to 52 is the estimate life expectancy. And so people who live a subhuman existence are really at the point of death. We've come this far by faith. Leaning on the Lord. At Nashville's riverfront, a new park bench is dedicated to the memory of Tara Cole, a young homeless woman murdered by two men who shoved her into the water from the place where she slept. I thought seven years ago that the death of Tara Cole would be a wake-up call for this community so that we could say never again would we allow this to happen. Never again. But now seven years later, it may be just a dream unless we can put our wills to create the public policy to create affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. While he's not afraid to lift a loud voice against the crisis of death, Strobel is also called upon to speak the last rites. Since Almighty God has called our brother Aqua from this life to himself, we commit his body to the earth from which it was made. I've done a lot of funerals. I've been to Potter's Field a lot. People deserve to have somebody say something good over them when they die, and I've done that. Hope I can always do that. This graveside ceremony brings together two estranged brothers abused as children. One became a missionary. The other is laid to rest in a pauper's plot. Well, I think the biggest thing as I threw dirt into the casket was just the, the pain in my heart of knowing that pretty much, for the most part, it's a wasted life. What could have been, it keeps rolling through my mind. But then I guess I do miss him. You know, I miss, I miss the, I never got the opportunity to have a real brother. For the folks that we serve, they have one thing after another. They just can't keep back. It's like when you're out in the ocean and you're trying to jump the waves and you fall down and you can't pick yourself back up. And what's this A-S-H for? That's right. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking those are your initials. <laughs> for years now, Charles Strobel has been one of those wading out into the murky waves of homelessness to try and lift up the people who keep getting knocked down and can't seem to stand up on their own. And certainly the person that we're honoring this evening is someone who in this community has worked for decades being utterly exhausted and glorifying God in that work. Recognition is not an easy thing for Charlie Strobel, whether it's being featured in a documentary or receiving an award. And I got nervous because of the Sermon on the Mount, which says, be on guard against performing religious acts for people to see, be on guard. And I think that's probably what every staff person and every volunteer says to themselves when they work at the room in the end. Because the room in the end is a, is a religious act. It's rooted in the love of God and the love of neighbor. The teenager you met earlier has moved back to his home county, but circumstances have split his family between friends and relatives. Remember Gary Hodge, the man Charlie Strobel brought in from the cold? He's now off the streets and has his own apartment. And Kateri Pomeroy no longer lives in a tent. She too has found a permanent place to live. Mark Cash says he's sober, reunited with his family, and performing the music he loves. Melvin Skates and Sean Pruitt, who came off the streets to live a life of hope, are continuing to share their success with others. And I have so much hope right now. I mean, I got in touch with my kids after 30, almost 30 years, you know, and, and now I see them. I went to my daughter's wedding. I was able to give her away, and, and that really blew her away and me away. You know? But it is the lives lost that have always burdened Charlie Strobel the most. They are remembered by the tree of life hanging on the wall at Room in the Inn. Darrell Elliott was hit by a car crossing the interstate over by L.P. Field. Vince Rowan was my own schoolmate. We were in school together. Never got off the streets. Michael Turner used to call me strobe light. <laughs> Tim McCoy was set on fire and murdered out by Rivergate. Over the years, all of these folks have become my extended family, because they have really become so much a part of who I am. And it's the same for the participants who've been here for years. They see people up here, and they see them as their brothers and sisters, and it's extremely emotional. 
Time is running out for the campers living behind Fort Negley. We're being kicked out, you know, and there's nowhere for us to go. The police officers, they come up here and said that they uh, notified me that I, that I wasn't supposed to be camping here now. And they gave me a piece of paper, you know, saying that they you know, may need to leave the premises. Oh, yeah. Well, there's trouble so coming to say hi. God bless you. For Charlie Strobel, the scenario facing the people who live here is all too familiar. Well, full circle, Room in the Inn is fin starting its 30th year. And it began when the Corps of Engineers disassembled, dismantled a tent city uh, uh, on the banks of the Cumberland. And so here we are 30 years later, and the same scenario is taking place. I have no idea what I'm going to do. We never come up with permanent solutions. As Strobel sees it, Attitudes toward the homeless have improved in the past 30 years, but he's frustrated that many people fail to recognize what the United Nations declared in 1948, that having food, clothing, and housing is not just a privilege, but a basic human right. In the world that I've been associated with for the last 30 years, there are individual happy endings, but culturally, and in the community, this is not a story that ends up with a beautiful riding off into the sunset and everybody is happy. Crossroads of Life or Death is produced with passion and purpose by the Jackson Foundation, with support from Freed Hardeman University, empowering students with a higher education that integrates Christian faith, scholarship, and service in Henderson, Memphis, Dixon, and online, and from Surgical Development Partners, partnering with physicians to build a stronger foundation for quality health care.